Even fellow Toastmasters, most welcome guests. I think my speech tonight is going to be as far from the expert to parade to just than, the, than the you than it can be, because I haven't had much pain on this, but uh, I have to deliver it up the nest. Okay, have a look at this. Most of Stuart amongst you will recognise it instantly as a £10 note. Queen's head on the front, Charles Darwin on the back, genuine kosher note of the realm. Of course there are notes available, I'm still working on collecting the others. Seen <laughs> <laughs> so in close up, it's intricately designed. Someone's obviously put quite a lot of effort into um, putting this together. But let's face it, seen from afar, this really could be any grubby, nondescript piece of paper you see and step over on the street. If it wasn't for what it actually is. Now its value really isn't in the aesthetics of it, it's really what it represents. What, it, what you can do with it, what it, what it can do for you. They say that money is a necessity of invention, or necessity of the mother of invention even. <laughs> Initially, it simply afforded us a way to measure the relative value of disparate goods. If we are, say, both livestock farmers, and I agree in principle that two of your sheep, uh, two of my sheep are worth one of, one of your cows, then you can imagine the conversation that ensues on the day when I rock up with my two sheep in the back and clock your obviously our malnourished cow. The sheep are obviously going to be quite concerned, they're in the back, they've done the maths, they realise the cow is only worth one and a half sheep. What's the, what, so what can they do? The best they can hope for is that the, the deal will be called off. The money's changed all that by abstracting the actual goods that are exchanged um, to a third party, i.e. coins and, and money, the, the deal can be renegotiated so that fairness is maintained. Makes sheep happy too. Since those early days, money has elbowed its way into everyday life and usage, so much so that even before we start school, we're aware of its somewhat magical qualities. It just seems to make nice things happen. If it had been good, our parents may occasionally buy us sweets or treats, special occasions such as birthdays or Christmas, we might look forward to presents. Most of us remember fondly family outings or holidays we had as kids and how carefree life was back then because money was really controlled by a bank of mum and dad who might issue it to us in the form of pocket money. However, harsh reality does kick in when we finally stumble out of education into the big wide world of work. <coughs> and finally, not only do you have to work harder for what you'd imagined, what you'd not only do you have to work harder than you imagine to earn what seems like a pittance for the number of hours you do, but more disturbingly, there are hordes of other people out there laying claims to your dosh. <laughs> Tax, national insurance, travel costs, possibly fuel, rent, food, all take a sizeable chunk out of your stash before you even think about the good use you can put to it, like socialising, saving, etc. As young adults, it's not uncommon to be keen to make our way into the world and lots of businesses will happily harness that energy to help drive them forward. That burning ambition to, to succeed is sometimes encouraged by the promise of higher wages, salaries or commissions. Some sectors such as banking seek to cultivate the culture quite often and will use the competitive nature of their trading staff to achieve a win at all cost attitude, which if allowed to go unchecked can lead to the financial times we've been experiencing of late. This has been the case where ambition has some, somehow morphed itself in a cynical, into a cynical, toxic mix of greed and selfishness as it, seems to, as it seeks to measure everything by a yardstick of money. But, as useful as money may be, it can only go so far. Please spare a thought for those who march to a different beat. Those for whom money is merely a means to an end. I'm talking about those people who trade in goods that money can't buy. Yet, they are essential, as essential a part of our economy, arguably even more so, as the multinational global brands. The goods traded in this alternative yet complementary economy are care, love, respect, intangibles which are impossible to value. None of this work tends to be public sector, though not exclusively. Consider, for instance, carers sometimes put their own lives and dreams and possibly considerable talents on hold to care for an alien relative or child. 
They won't make money, much money in a conventional sense, but their value is truly life-changing for those they care for. Medical staff, some of who can be highly paid, but sometimes the actual caregivers who perform the essential, sometimes menial tasks, are low paid because their skill is not seen to be specialised enough to warrant better care, better pay. There are others I could mention, like artists, for instance, seldom highly paid, but whose endeavours and passions make all of our lives a little bit more colourful than it otherwise would be. I could go on, there are others like elderly, the infirm, people who don't really actively bring money into the economy, but who's, who, make our, who enrich our lives immensely. It just goes to say that there's no money, there's no escaping it. It has a vice-like grip on our lives. Its pervasive nature tends to touch more parts of our society than maybe it should. My intent here was to highlight really just how wrong it is to rush to judgment by inferring that those who earn the most are somehow superior beings in some way. The increasing income gap in our society is having an effect of driving a wedge between those who have and have not Sensationalist media coverage of the thrivers and skyvers in such programmes such as Benefit Street of Hell. In contrast, those rival economies, in quotes, are in fact codependent, some symbiotic. Without one, the other cannot exist. Just to summarise, really, one of my favourite quotes about cynicism about money comes from Oscar Wilde. A cynic is described as someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. I'll hang you back to the Toastmasters for the evening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>